just want to say there's a lot of intelligent conversation going on in female bathroom because there's nothing like that. <laughs> I mean, I honestly never, I mean, if you go in the bathroom in the male bathroom and you eat, mm -hmm. go anywhere for that matter, you will never see a, a man ask a question like, okay, fellas, you know, I have a premature ejaculation problem. Is anybody here? After that, all you're going to see is, ha ha ha, what's up wrong with you? You'll never see somebody come back and say, well, have you tried this? Have you tried that? No, in the women's bathroom, I don't know about here. Mm -hmm. Are there graffiti in the bathrooms here? Sure. Okay. I recall it. Yeah, I, I read, yeah, and as a writer, I read everything, and I'm telling you, now, I, I must note, you know, I've been teaching for almost 25 years, and I must note that there's a decline in graffiti at my campus now. Um, even when I just started there in 93, there was a lot of, a lot of graffiti, and now they're not so much, so I'm not sure what that means in terms of women having spaces or getting the information. I think that has switched to probably the internet, uh, Facebook, or some other kind of site. So I think that's why there's a decrease, but it's still there. And they're still asking some of the basic questions. And this is why I say it's so important to have our program to educate women, because the things that you think they know, they don't know. It's still amazing to me, because you think all of this information is available, and some of the same basic questions whether it's about masturbation, or about abortion, or about sex. Those, some of those same questions I've seen since 87, I am still seeing. And so the information isn't being shared. And so there's a real gap there that needs to happen. I had a student who did a, a master's degree in graffiti oh. in secondary schools. And she found that the graffiti in the prestige schools, mm -hmm. the convents and well, they know, I don't know, the concept of the prestige schools, that it was very um, violent, wow. and very uh, language was very crude and, and, and very violent. You're, you're talking about people asking for instruction, mm -hmm. so, which is a different thing. She said there was a lot of expression of, of, of anger, violence, a lot of crude, um, aggressive sentiments being um, expressed mm -hmm. in the graffiti, particularly the graffiti in the prestige schools in Trinidad. Wow. I would love to see I, I have found precisely the same thing. I teach at bishops um, on an evening. I teach Kyrie and the And um, when I go to the restroom, the language is filthy, crude, violent, aggressive. Mm -hmm. This is the show. girls' schools, one of our presidents in the girls' school. And, and I was really shocked. And I discussed it. My three daughters, they all went to the shops. They said to me that this is what they do. I, there is also, since this is supposed to be posh school, um, you could see the desperate attempts to wipe it off because teachers like myself were coming and of course they want to have a negative But if you go into the bathrooms, that the girls use. Mm -hmm. um, well, I'm glad to hear that a student did that because I've long felt that the sociological, psychological historical cultural impact of what is being written is so important and that there needs to be study around that um, and I haven't you know um, well Berkeley I guess is a prestigious college UC Berkeley um, but I didn't find that much difference between UC Berkeley and when I taught at San Francisco State um, and now I'm at an arts college as I said there's less now but I think that's because the technology is, is different and there might be different ways, but there's still some um, that, that occur. Uh, less questions about certain things. I haven't seen a question about abortion for a long time. Um, but there's still questions about just the body, you know, how do I, as a woman, uh, what am I supposed to feel like? Those kinds of things. Is certain things, masturbation, good or bad? Is something wrong with that? So there is still that need for women to get answers, and they're not getting the answers. And so there's that gap that we need to fill. And those, the dialogue 
and the opening up of the dialogue that needs to occur. I just wanted to say that people are beginning again to have rights of young women and young men entering that age and it's becoming more and more prevalent both here and I mean I was asked to be part of two so far in the States and it's very interesting that thing that you said because um, one of the facets of the thing and I, I actually have a formula that we put together for it um, is the thing of ancestors so when we have photos of the female ancestors and libations and so to them so in that way you call and pay reverence to their experiences and also um, the thing about having mentors so that I think there were seven of them that we selected, one for spiritual, one for education, one for so on, so that the, the girl in particular was surrounded by the circle of women that they could go to with, with strengths in various areas. And these women had the permission of the family and, and the mother to to chastise, correct, and so But a very interesting facet of what we did was that when all the women had finished, talked, and had given advice in their areas, we presented them to the men, and the men of the family and the household of the extended family you know, took responsibility for protecting and guiding, and they spoke. Very, very beautiful thing that we have before. And I found, I found that there were actually remnants amongst African families here of, of rites of passage associated with the first period that were done amongst certain families. I was amazed. I didn't know this existed, but actually it, they survived. Yeah, those certainly rites of passage need to be done across culture, across economic lines. It's definitely um, important. And so this book is really for, uh, this book is dedicated to my two daughters, Shola and Teju, because it's a book for women. Um, it's a book that I think helps women go through the various stages, young women, for them to see and then their fortune form a course so that they don't have to go through some of the things that their mothers and grandmothers um, had to withstand in order for that to happen. It feels as though it's a long form that's been cut up. Uh, mm -hmm. So it feels like, is that, was that intentional or was that? But I just want to say that women fear menopause so much. And um, when I was entering menopause, we really go through all the funny kinds of things. And my spiritual mother, the Alusha Melvin, she said to me, child, don't afraid that, you know, don't afraid that. When you see you're done with them things, because you know that I saw you with the when you see you're done with them things, you could walk when either man or woman could walk. In the spirit, is both man and woman stronger than either one and that has guided me so much and helped me understand my way as I moved to Elder. So I just want to... Yeah, you know, at first I wasn't going to name them, um, although in naming them I had to then really look at what the various breads or fruits were. Um, but yeah, for me, each of these sections is like one love poem. Um, but they're just broken up into these areas. Really well, yeah. well, thank you for that. I'm sure, not my next book, my next book is about my father. My next book is collection is about my father. Certainly, I'm going to be writing about menopause. <laughs> and it's already titled Men Pause. Yeah. And, and all that's in, in, in between there. Yeah. 
So I just want to give people a, 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 a taste of, not a taste, but just tell you what I'm working on next. Um, March 15th will be the second year that my father died. And when he died, I wrote a long essay piece about him and for him. And I have been, since then, working on a collection. In fact, I thought I'd finished the collection and I restarted it, um, which is called The Scent of My Father, because the title just came. And so um, the next poetry collection is a tribute to my father and our relationship. And the things that I never knew about him, some of which I learned through letters and pieces and stuff together, and the things I'm imagining about him. And you know, the gaps in our relationship and the relationship with the, the, the both imagine and real relationship that we have. So, um, um, again, I walked in the room and it's real, it's real point that I was in the only adult male in the whole room, yeah. right? And when you started off, you were talking about your son grew up with his two daughters and his mother. That's my life, you know? Mm -hmm. okay. But there's still so many things that remain as a mystery. Like, and two talking about my first class, like, and they're ready made me think about, because the things that as, as men, we don't even get the opportunity to meditate on, you know? We're so busy with our, with our own lives and our own challenges and our own, that the women that we live with, the women we inhabit this space with, the women we make love to, the women who are part of our lives, that we don't even really sit back and, so this is how you experience the world. Okay. And then sometimes we're not allowed into these little secret circles, because if I wasn't here, somebody said, I mean, you know, I read your book, but what can I really garner from it? You know, without meeting people like Enzo, who has no cover for her mouth at all, who just <laughs> tell me things. It's just like, you need to know this. Plus your grandmother is a good Plus friend. my grandmother, right? Okay. But even my grandmother, it takes some coaxing, you know? Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I think a lot of times when, when these books come out, you know, they're snatched up by, by um, women, as, as you said, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that whole movement. But, really really helpful for men. This is really like handbooks and guidebooks for men. So then we read this say like, okay, so that's why she'll be here. So, right. Okay, so that's why she'll be okay, it's not me. Right. Okay, and it's also so it's me. I mean for me, you know, one of the things my mother always says that I'm always writing these things, you should be writing about that. Again, my mother is eighty five so you have to understand that. But for me is that these things are not secret. We keep them secret no. and they're not secret because they impact our relationship and the way we move in the world, but somehow we were told that we couldn't talk about them. So for me, it's like, here, have this public dialogue. Yeah, yeah definitely. So that's... Uh, I appreciate what you said about coming to this stage that you, uh, your poems are becoming more and more sparse that allow people to make their own meanings. Um, I really think that's a function of maturity mm -hmm. and, and that it will take also take a maturity to pursue the meanings in the world. Because really, I think younger people, especially at this time, I don't know if it's because of the strong emphasis on um, visual culture, they're very much in the read and spell mode. They're not prepared to pursue something, to allow it to be. Either are they prepared to experience, to allow themselves to experience the, 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 the poetry. Um, so I think I, I appreciate that, what you've done, and I also appreciate the performance because the performance invites you into it and then you cannot help but, you know, walk away with some kind of meaning, some kind of uh, something that has changed because you have experienced the performance of the world. So I just want to, you know, thank you and to encourage you to continue to, to perform your work um, for, to help, to, to give people a doorway in. Mm -hmm. Because what I'm finding increasingly with teaching literature is that um, people don't necessarily want to experience the literature. Mm -hmm. yeah? mm -hmm. They wanted to give them a little formula for writing an essay. Yes. Yeah. What I wanted to ask you though, um, in reading about your work, um, I know there is one, uh, there is a work that you've done on, on the map. Mm -hmm. Until judgment, uh, and um, which you, um, which I hear described as a very positive, a, a very positive piece, and I would be really glad if you would tell us a little bit about that because um, because everything that we're getting about man the male nowadays is just negative, 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 and I think we need to 
pull back and get some balance. Anyway, it's called, I think you're referring to the short story collection called Until Judgment Comes. Yeah. And it's a story about seven Jamaican men. But it's right. really not about Jamaican men. It's about Caribbean men. It's about men. And really what I was looking at in that collection, because what had happened is that in the last 10 years, there have been a lot of violent crimes in Jamaica against women. And one time, women were exempt from certain crimes in Jamaica. I mean, you know, there were always the case of rape, but the way, the, the kinds of things that are happening to women, were, they were being raped and, you know, people were defecating in their mouth, just some really horrendous stuff. Now, I've been accused of blaming the victim, and I'm not blaming the victim. You know, we're all victims in this thing. But one of the things I was looking at, and I'd always, it had always bothered me, was the way in which sometimes some women in the society, because they were angry with the father, because the father leave them, because the father A, support them, you know, they have a lot of valid reasons, would project that hate, resentment, yeah. anger on their sons. And so I remember one little boy who was considered a bad boy in the neighborhood, he was beaten constantly, and his mother and everybody else would say, you you're you just like your walkless father. So I thought, something has got to change. You know, we've got to look at that and we've got to, again, is that we're not having these important dialogues. Yes. We are not having these important dialogues. We see that happening and we don't in the moment say to the mother, mother, this is wrong. We don't take the child away and say, what your mother is doing to you is wrong. She's angry, she needs help, it's wrong. So this collection of stories look at that issue, particularly in three men. One is where the mother doesn't physically beat the child, she beats him once, but it's the psychological damaging and, and picking away at his manhood as his, at himself. And uh, in one of the stories, which is called Bad Boy, the mother does beat him, and then she goes, and she says, because corporal punishment was at that time, I think maybe still is anyway, in Jamaica, you know, so she goes to school and she says to the teacher, in bad, beat him. So the teacher beat him, and everybody beat him. And, and the way in which we throw our mouth at children, in bad, and so that becomes a person's identity. They have no room to grow. So in this collection, Until Judgment Comes, I'm looking at that, and I'm saying, we've got to stop. We've got to heal that. You know, yeah, regardless of what the father did or didn't do, you have a responsibility not to pass that on. And I'm also saying I went further because what I'm suggesting in this book is that some of the misogyny that we're seeing in the society, and I'm no psychologist, huh? so I'm making leaps, but some of the misogyny that we're seeing in the society are the result of young men who are brutalized emotionally and physically by their mothers and other women in the community as children. And so when they come big, they're toughing up a woman. They're getting back, you know? Um, and, and so this is why it's so important as mothers that we have workshops for mothers, um, whether they're single or, or, or in a relationship, and about how to talk to not just your boys, but how to talk to your children and what you're passing on, and how that can have adverse impact, not just for you, but for other people. Because what you, you, you do not regard, you know, I know, and again, it's a fight I've had in the Caribbean that believes in corporal punishment, that many people still believe in corporal punishment, and don't want to look at the antecedent of slavery and the way we were beaten and that kind of stuff. Um, what I'm trying to say is that this has impact, and we have to be very careful. And that we have to call each other up and we have to pull each other up and say this is not right because it is going to have adverse ramifications in the future. So that collection is about men. And it's about, again, healing the relationship between men and women, between mothers and sons, particularly those mothers who have had to do it alone and who, because they have been unable to resolve their own anger and resentment for these men that they selected but who has not, in their eyes, treated them well and then continue to project that negativity onto their sons and, uh, and create, you know, kind of erosion and disruption. Um, I, did, I did two workshops based on that novel in um, California. Uh, I, someone who is a social worker came to one of my meetings and invited me to do a workshop. 
And I have done, and I've been working on parenting workshops, but I haven't done it extensively. But it's something that I think is really essential and important. It's a student house, right? Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of students living there, you know, renting us. And when you saw, you came and you saw our rehearsal, so we have the three backup singers, and there will be other people who will pass through, right? And I was coming out to the house one day, and the guy who doesn't really speak to me, one of the fellas there, calls out to me, it was in the night. Come on! Say, yeah, man. Say, yo, why are you to get a touch on get that respect? I say, what do you mean? You see the kind of paraphernalia I see leaving here? This is the way the man is, right? And this is how I who. Well, I don't, I don't know him like that. But this is, the, this is how he has internalized woman in his life and this is him and three other fellows who are in complete agreement mm -hmm. and I started up there as somebody who I don't think anything like that I, I couldn't even imagine I say well that's the wrong word first of all is a start off bad mm -hmm. but to him he and he and you know and he is a representation of a lot a lot a lot you know mm -hmm. and like I said before you know just these little tidbits of information is so helpful mm -hmm. because if you not if we we as men really don't know how, how women travel to the world you know, we don't know. We have we get glimpses, you know, especially when we get into relationships. We get these little glimpses that this this being is so much different to, to, to me. And so similar in some ways, but we really And that speaks to something else that needs to happen. There needs to be these dialogue or these sessions with men and women. Um, sharing what does it mean to be a man? Because as women we don't necessarily know that either what kinds of things you encounter. Just like how you say you wouldn't find men in the bathroom saying, well, you know, I can't get it up. What do I do? Yeah. You know, but yet women are having these kinds of dialogues in the restroom. So there needs to be a space where women and men can come together and speak honestly and openly about those things, you know, and the, the expectations that each has and that society has imposed, that needs to, to happen and it has to happen. So um, I'm going so uh, I'm going to end by reading one poem for both people who came in late. Um, and I'm going to read it from um, the clear breaking point section. Down swims beneath me when I walk. I am neither miracle nor savior, so why the sea has a hold of me, puzzling. Very slowly, very quietly, I inquire of myself. I advise myself to listen to myself, do as myself tells me, walk even though running is more logical. Trap number one. Why haven't the other fishes told their family about nets lined with worms? I won't listen to myself, concentrating instead, carefully placing one foot in front of the other. The fishes accuse me, my pace tricks the sea to stay calm, the wave undulates, the waves undulate, fire in my jealousy. My Ibo ancestors drifted on the waves all the way back to Africa. Did they stop to fish when they were hungry, eat sushi and protect their bodies with whale oil? I backtrack, hoping to find my divided selves soldered me a boat. So, you know, that piece has a lot of historical stuff, mythology and reality and, and, um, and how sometimes when the mind is frayed and fraying, how it plots at different kinds of threads and try to piece them together. So thank you.